Praise the Lord, saints. We are continuing our series entitled The Weapons of Our Warfare. And at first, I was going to say that we took, uh, I guess, a side journey last week uh, based upon our Mother's Day message, but I did connect that with spiritual warfare. So, in a sense, we've continued on even throughout that. So, um, over the last, ooh, I guess maybe a month, we've looked at some of the phrases that are found in our text scripture, uh, being strong in the Lord and in power of his might, putting on the whole armor of God, and talked about standing against the wiles of the devil. And today we're going to continue on with the, the phrase, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Um, so before we do that, let's open up in a word of prayer and we will continue. Thank God. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the praise, honor, and glory for everything you're doing in our lives. And we just thank you, Father, that you've given us the opportunity once again to partake of your word, which is manna from on high. It has the capacity to strengthen us, um, guide us, reprove us, energize us, give us um, insight, light a path before our feet, um, impart wisdom into the lives of others. So we just thank you, Father, for it. And even as we continue to study uh, principles relating to spiritual warfare and the weapons of our warfare, we just thank you, Father, that um, even before we go into the specific weapons, that you would continue to build us up and arm and equip us, perfect, hone and refine us so that we can serve you faithfully. We thank you, Father, for the principles that we're going to share today. We ask, Father, that as it's relevant to our daily lives, that you would bring it, bring it back to our remembrance. And we give you the glory, honor, and praise, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I know I didn't read uh, the entirety of the text scripture, so I will do that now. And it's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So as I said, we're talking about the weapons of a warfare, and uh, this week we're continuing on um, by examining the fact that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Praise the Lord. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And our first passage of scripture we're going to look at, let's see, is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 6. But prior to me reading that, one of the things that I want to really point out uh, from a text scripture is that it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And that phrase, flesh and blood, is what is referred to as a Hebraism. A Hebraism. Amen? And um, you might say, well, what is a Hebraism? Um, it's not necessarily slang. Um, it's kind of like a colloquialism something that people within that group of individuals, that community or that culture would understand. So even though it's saying flesh and blood, it's actually referring to um, uh, human beings or men, of course, men and women. Um, and it's kind of similar to, I think I told Pam yesterday, um, looking at this thing where the phrase was, don't play. You know, an adult person in the African-American community might say to a child, don't play. And somebody else might look at it and say, well, what do you mean don't play? Children aren't allowed to play? No. When you say don't play, you're talking about, look, you don't have expectations. 
You know you better walk in obedience. Don't act like you don't understand what I expect of you, and there's going to be consequences. Don't play. Amen. <laughs> so flesh and blood during that time was a similar type of phrase that they weren't really talking about the literal flesh on your skin or the blood going through your veins that you're um, not wrestling against. They're saying you're not wrestling against people or human beings, and you're wrestling against um, supernatural foes. And if we go further in that um, phrase, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the word wrestle was for um, illustrative purposes to give the person an, Ill, an image of athletes competing in the Olympic Games of the time uh, to gain national glory and honor. So people had an image. It's almost like, you know, we use a sports analogy now um, regarding the Sixers or the Eagles or whatever team you choose to talk about. When you use um, uh, the, a particular phrase, people will understand it as it relates to athletics. So um, wrestling was giving them that image, you know, two warriors fighting for, you know, their city state or their country, wrestling against somebody that was an opponent from another nation. And if they wrestled and they came out victorious by pinning the opponent or making that person tap out, then that person had the highest of honors. We even see it to this day with Olympic athletes. They get the gold medal, then they come back and they get the TV commercials and that sort of thing. So the illustration here is that we're not wrestling against human beings. No, we're wrestling and pulling them, you know, and adjusting our body and repositioning and analyzing the moves of a supernatural enemy that's trying to pin us. So we have to make sure that we're wise enough that we don't allow that to occur, and we know how to engage the enemy. So like I said, the apostle doesn't mean that Christians, um, oh, I'm sorry, going further, the apostle, even though he's saying we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, he is not saying that we don't have any men enemies among people that oppose us, you know, because a lot of times we're going to be exposed to fiery persecution, criticism, false accusation. You know, um, so it's not saying that we don't have to contend with the carnal and corrupt uh, propensities of people or our own nature. Um, these things are still true as much today as they were then. You are going to have fleshly things that you engage in, human beings that have conflicts with you. It's going to occur, but he wants us to realize that even though the host body or the person you're engaging with might be of human origin, there's still underlying principles and spiritual influences, attacks, and things that are coming your way that are behind the scenes seeking an opening to destroy you. So yes, we will engage in earthly, um, man-made, or, or human-oriented conflict, but realize that behind the scenes there's other things working, even if the person that you're dealing with doesn't realize that they're a pawn of these spiritual influences. Amen? Praise the Lord. So anyway, um, we're going to continue on with that, realizing once again that the source and origin of all spiritual conflicts, amen, is the warfare that's behind the scene in the spirit realm, even if it's inspiring human beings. And that is where the warfare has to be won. Because if you just beat the, that person, amen, the influences behind the scene can still be in operation to spark that person to come at you again, or to influence other people to join in, or to come from another angle. So the true fight, you know, you might pin that fleshly opponent, but don't think you've won, because that spirit behind it might either reanimate that person, react that person to come at you again, or they'll just bounce over to somebody else, and now, wait a minute, I thought you were, me and you were cool, and you're fighting with them as well. So the great thing about that, though, is even though we wrestle not against flesh and blood, God enables us to fight. And that's our first subtopic for today. God enables us to fight. Not our flesh, not our attitude, not our fleshly strength. God is the one who enables us to fight. And we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God 
to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So once again, we're seeing um, a similar phrase that we saw in, it, in our text scripture. It says, even though we walk in his flesh. In other words, we navigate through life, through these physical bodies. So you are going to walk. You can't avoid it. You're going to walk in your human body. But even though you walk in your human body, you don't have to walk according to the ways of the flesh. So we inhabit these flesh suits, but we don't have to walk according to the nature of this, these flesh suits, nor do we have to engage in battle according to the flesh. If we do that, we're just limiting, limiting ourselves to only the capacity that we had as human beings before we were saved. But in the next phrase, it is showing us that even though we walk in our fleshly bodies, we don't have to war according to our fleshly bodies, traits, talents, strength, because the weapons of our warfare even though we're fleshly in our bodies, the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly or world-oriented in nature, but they are mighty through God. So we walk in these flesh suits, but we don't have to war after, according to the mindset, principles, and operating methodologies of these flesh suits. Because the weapons we were given are not fleshly, they're supernatural in origin. So we have to make sure, though, that the weapon is available, but it's not any good to you unless you choose to wield it and you know how to wield it. Right. Amen. I could pick up a bazooka right now if there's enemy troops coming my way, but if I don't know how to load that thing, aim it, and fire, what good is the bazooka doing me? I mean, they could come up and take my life, and I was sitting there the whole time holding a bazooka. Couldn't get it to fire. Mm -hmm. So weapons aren't good unless you know how to use them. So... He's telling us, though, you know, and that's the other thing, too. If God has given me a supernatural weapon, but yet I choose to only pick up the carnal weapons, then I'm limited by the capacity of the carnal weapon. Amen? And it might work this time, but is it guaranteed to work every time? No. That's why you might actually see carnal weapons at your disposal. And you have to be in a mindset, though, oh, I can take this weapon of accusations. And I can take this other weapon of they're trying to ruin my reputation so let me spread some rumors. I can pick up all those weapons or I can say wait a minute. God's given me weapons that aren't carnal in origin. You know what? Let me grab one of these and use this in my battle. So don't think just because God has provided supernatural weapons that that's going to automatically be the thing that every Christian chooses to use. And quite frankly, part of our warfare at times is making the decision that although I could use this carnal weapon, you know, you might have something that, you know, is a fact that you can use to counterattack and ruin that rep person's reputation. But even though the carnal weapon's there, and you might, from a fleshly perspective, be justified even in picking up that carnal weapon and firing it, am I going to do it this way or do I want to do it God's way? Amen? So the weapon might be, they're trying to undermine me, and take my position, get me fired. Well, I got some juice on them, so I'm going to use this weapon. But God might say, no, use a spiritual weapon. Go operate in love, reconciliation, peace. Right. Try to make a friend out of that enemy. Right. Amen? And matter of fact, the same thing you can use against them, if you take that and say, hey, look, I got to talk to you about something. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the problem here. I can help you resolve it. You might win an enemy using the spiritual weapons that God has placed at our disposal. So the weapons of warfare are all there, carnal, supernatural. Which one do you choose to wield? That's all a choice of the individual. And we see here, though, the weapons of our warfare, if we're, if we're wise, it says that they're not carnal. They're supernatural and mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's a lot of barriers that try to surround us 
on a daily basis to block our path in God, to hedge us up and, and corner us. You know, and sometimes we say, hey, I don't see any way and I don't have the strength to get through that wall. There might be times that you've tried to climb over that wall to, you know, make an opening in that wall to even dig underneath, to crawl under, <laughs> underneath that wall. You can't get through. But we see here that that might be because you try to use all the carnal weapons and tools at your disposal. But we see here that when you use God's weapons, it says that they're mighty through him and it gives you the capacity to pull down the strongholds. In other words, you can break through some of the things that you couldn't get through previously on your own carnal strength. And it doesn't say that, okay, well, they're hardy. <laughs> they're pretty strong. No, it says they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Then it goes into the mental warfare that we have to deal with. Casting down imaginations. You know, uh, we can imagine some crazy things, especially when we're um, being bombarded with accusations and people trying to undermine us. And, you know, we're going to be honest, a lot of times some of the first things that come to mind is like, oh, you want to do that? You know, well, I'm going to do this. Or you said that about me, I'm going to say this about you. And you attack me once, I'm going to double down and, and get you back. You know, I've shared before that my mindset before I got saved is that, you know, you did something to me, I wouldn't get even. I had to get more than even. Because I would not only get you for what you did, but I would send a shot across the bow, don't mess with me in the future. Because now I want to go further than you did. Amen. So that's not something that's a type of warfare that God wants us to do. So when people are doing things and when the enemy is hurling attacks at us through fleshly hosts or, or people that are influenced by the enemy. Um, sometimes the imagination does cross our mind of this is what I could do to turn this situation around or here's what I could do to, to fix them. No, God says don't allow yourself to go down that path of imaginations. We can be very creative in terms of the things we can scheme to do. But God tells us, you know, to cast those things down. Don't give them any place in your thought life. Don't allow them to take hold of your mind, your heart, and your spirit. But you know, if this thing does not exalt itself, um, if it try, I'm sorry, if it tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, he tells us, cast it down. Don't give it any room. And he said, matter of fact, don't just cast it down. Bring that thing into captivity. You're not going to plague my mind anymore. You're not going to feel, you know, my, fill my mind and my heart and my spirit with this devious schemes to you know, fight warfare. I'm going to bring this thing into captivity and every thought that tries to come in to distort, to delude, or to take me off the path of God, I'm going to subject that thing to being in prison so that it no longer has authority over my life. And when those thoughts try to come their way, you know, we punish them. No, I'm not going to give you place. You know, I'm silencing you. Um, so the word war here, you know, that we walk in the flesh, but we do not war as of the flesh. The war, word war means to serve in a military campaign. To serve in a military campaign. It also means to contend with carnal inclinations. To contend with carnal inclinations. And here's one I found interesting. <laughs> The third one is to execute the apostolate with its arduous duties and functions. To execute the apostolate, that's basically the role of an apostle or, you know, we can bring it on home to our own personal lives. To execute the operations of your ministry with all its arduous duties and functions. You know, arduous would be difficult, tedious. You know, things that might tire you out a little bit. But it's basically telling us that, you know, as we're executing some of the responsibilities um, associated with our walk in God, some of them are more difficult, tedious. They take more time, more patience. They become very arduous at times. 
but they're part of our ministry. And God has told us that we're not warring after the responsibilities, amen. We engage in battle according to the mindset and the word of God, and it gives us a capacity, amen, to continue on, um, to do all the things that we're responsible for. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to move on. The next passage of scripture, we're still talking about how God enables us to fight. The next passage is Jesus himself speaking. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. It says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And there's several, there's a phrase and a couple of words that really... Um, bring this thing home in terms of what it means and the revelation that um, we need on a daily basis. Uh, first it says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, it's still ongoing. And what's ongoing? It says, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Um, in other words, the underlying Greek says, the kingdom of heaven, heaven endures force. It's enduring force and violence. The enemy's trying to do things um, another phrase is to be seized. He's trying to seize or take things away from you. And then another thing it says is uh, he, he tries to crowd himself into. The enemy tries to crowd himself into your life. In other words, tries to squeeze the life out of you or to crowd you into to get you, get you in a place where you don't have free movement. You're backed into a corner or you know, it's like somebody's pressing down on you so that you can't flow or function. You're so crowded that you no longer have free movement. It reminds me of an episode of, uh, just comes to mind, Star Trek, where there was a planet where the people's technology, if I recall correctly, became so incredible that people would just stop dying. And when the crew of the Enterprise came there, um, as usual, Captain Kirk gets attracted to one of the leader's daughters, and they don't realize they're setting him up so that he could kiss her or something like that. She would catch his germs, and that would be used to spread disease so that finally the people could start to get sick and die off because uh, at one point in the show, they actually opened up uh, this window or pane, and you could see all the people just bumping around each other. They could barely move. And they, they couldn't die. They're so healthy, they couldn't die. So they were literally welcoming death. But it's it just the illustration, all those people crowd together where they could barely even move their arms, amen. And, and unfortunately, that's what the devil tries to do with us. And it doesn't matter whether it's a crowd of saints or one person walking in their faith with God. He tries to crowd you so you, you can't move. Like, I can't move my arm. I can barely move my fingers. The, the enemy's got me so boxed in, so squeezed that... I don't have the liberty that Jesus intended for me to have, and I feel like I'm totally straight-jacketed. Amen? I can't move. So he's warning us. He's saying from the days of John the Baptist until now, and it will continue onward, the kingdom of heaven suffers force coming its way. It suffers the enemy trying to take things away from it, and it suffers the fact that the enemy tries to crowd us, either once again, to box us in and to totally eliminate our movements or to squeeze the life, the vibrancy, and the joy out of us. The great thing about it, though, Jesus first warns us that the kingdom of heaven will suffer, suffer these things, and we're part of the kingdom of heaven. But he goes to the next phrase immediately and says, even though the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, he didn't say just like wave the, wed, the, the white flag of surrender, try to negotiate peace with the kingdom of darkness so they'll leave you alone, or you give it a certain amount of your ground. Okay, I'll let you have this part of my life, but leave the rest of me alone in peace. No, we don't negotiate. He says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but what? The violent take it by force. And the word violent means an energetic enforcer. And there's a reason why he's telling us that we have to be energetic enforcers. If you consider the fact that the, the kingdom that you're a part of is going to suffer violence, things being squeezed out and seized and enduring force, 
Why would Jesus then say, well, you're going to suffer this, this total bombardment, you know, full war coming your way, and oh, just be this little mealy mouth, weak, you know, limp wristed Christian. No, he said, the enemy's trying to take your stuff, trying to kill you, squeeze you out, do this. And he says, no, don't sit there and suck it up. He says, you got to be an energetic enforcer. No, you're not taking my stuff, devil. It's funny, like, as an NBA fan, um, you know, growing up, especially during the era of the, the 80s, where you had the Rick Mahorns and the Terry Catchings and Kevin Duckworth and, and people like that, Charles Oakley. You know, every basketball team had your, uh, your high-flying all-star players that had the finesse game. You know, the, Do the Dr. J's and uh, the Clyde Drexlers and stuff like that. But the problem is they played a very physical game. And, you know, sometimes, you know, Dr. J would come to the hole with that little finger roll, go to dunk, and somebody would be like, you're going to eat some floor. Bam! Knock them to the floor. And when they did that, the energetic enforcers came in and would push the guy to the side or might throw a punch and, and say, no, you ain't going to treat my player like that. You hit my star player on this team, you got to deal with me. I'm the team enforcer. And every team in the NBA literally had a player. Some of them couldn't really even play basketball that, that well. The most they could do is play defense, maybe grab a, a couple rebounds. But at the end of the day, the team that scores the most is the one that wins the game. You'd be lucky if you gave this guy, these guys 10 shots at the basket with nobody on them to make it. But their role was not to do that. Their role was, I'm the team tough guy. I'm the enforcer. If you mess with our scorers and the smaller guys on our team, you got to deal with me, and I'm going to make you pay for it. So they had energetic enforcers on every NBA team. Now, God wants us to be enforcers within the kingdom of God. Now, we don't go out and throw punches and pick fights, but when the enemy tries to crowd you, see stuff, and and make you endure force, he's saying don't be passive, be an energetic enforcer, and don't allow him to do those things that he's trying to do. And in some cases, we have to be enforcers um, for those who are weaker than us. That's what the enforcers on the NBA teams in the 80s used to do. Amen. It's not that they didn't respect um, the ability of their star players to be able to handle themselves. They just felt, my job is to, like, Anytime force is coming our way, I'm going to step in and make sure it stops now and the buck stops with me. There's a line drawn in the sand and you can't get past me to get to them. Or at the first time of sign of you attacking them, I'm stepping in and you've got to deal with me. Sometimes God has people that, you know, not only are we protecting and guiding and guarding our own lives, but there's people that are under our watch spiritually that God says, you're going to be the energetic enforcer. You'll step in and say, devil, no, the line is here. You're not going to cross. And then finally it says, the violent, the energetic enforcers, take it by force. The word force means to cease, I'm sorry, to seize, pluck, catch, or snatch away. Once again, it means to seize, pluck, catch, or snatch away. So that means trying to seize your stuff. <laughs> and God's saying, no, I need you to be, or Jesus is saying, I need you to be an energetic enforcer. He's trying to seize your stuff. Instead, you're going to turn that around and give him a greater violence, a greater force, a greater enforcement, and you're going to snatch back anything that the enemy has stolen. So instead of being this, the victim of things being seized, you are now the person that turns that around, and you're the one who's snatching stuff away. Praise the Lord. So um, that's another aspect of God showing us how to fight or enabling us to fight. Let's go to another one by Jesus, um, Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to look at verses 18 through 20. Matthew 18. 18 through 20. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, 
It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And that's really uh, shows you the wisdom of Jesus Christ. You know, earlier on, he told us how we're going to suffer violence as being citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Then he tells us that, hey, the enemy's going to try to crowd you, to attack you violently and seize stuff, but you're going to seize stuff back and yourself as energetic enforcers. And then we get later on, in this passage of scripture, he says that, he's basically telling us that there might be times where you can't go it alone. Amen? You know, Jesus Christ is, is powerful and wonderful as he was, amen, he had his disciples at his side that handled different responsibilities. And yes, could he have done it by himself? Of course. But he was doing that as part of that, that aspect of family and ministry and joining together and also discipling those who were, you know, at his side. And he's telling us here that you can't go it alone. And, and if, if he went around with people that were under his training, even if you're in the role of the mentor, there should be people that you're training, people that you're overseeing. Um, it's not just, I'm this lone ranger out here walking my faith by myself. And as we see here, there's times that you might be coming up against things that are more difficult. And he's telling us that you don't have to go it all alone. He says, if you get together with other people, you know, and it doesn't have to be this large group of 100 saints, even though that's a great thing. But hey, if you can just get two people, he said, if the two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, and it has to be according to his will, that we can bind and loose things and see the manifestation of them here on the earth. So he's shown us that there's a power associated with us unifying and joining together um, with other saints. You know, look at there at the end, verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in his name. He says, I'm in the midst of you. So you're guaranteed a group of four at the very least um, if you join together with your fellow saints. And that's a, 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 an important aspect of the things that we're doing with God. Um, so that's all we're going to share for um, that subtopic. Amen. And we're now going to move on to another one. So once again, that was God enables us to fight. The next aspect is that you cannot wrestle if you're not properly trained. You cannot wrestle if you're not properly trained. And, you know, I've literally seen this. Um, you might be bigger. You might be stronger. But if you go against somebody who is highly trained in wrestling um, or jiu-jitsu, one of those ground fighting um, sports or disciplines, it doesn't matter because with them it's, it's leverage and it's arm locks and it's positioning your body and your legs and just, just different techniques. And, you know, that's the last thing you want to do is to go to the ground and wrestle with somebody that truly knows how to wrestle. And, you know, like I said, I've seen situation. We had this guy, um, this, 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 this small guy at a martial arts school named Peter. Um, but he's, he's, he's wrestled before. He knows jujitsu. I'm not saying he's a master, but he knows it enough. And there's been times where people like my size and stuff are going to the ground with him. Next thing you know, he, he's got them like that because he knows how to wrestle. So are you bigger than him? Yes. Are you stronger than him? Yes. Do you outweigh him? Yes. But he knows based upon his technique and angles and shifting his body weight and, and actually using your weight and momentum against him to get you to a position where now you're being subjected to his force. He knows how to maneuver to take advantage of uh, what you would think would be greater attributes. So, you know, it's fine that uh, God is telling us that uh, we're not wrestling against people um, and, and, and earthly things, but we're wrestling against principalities, but you better learn how to wrestle. Otherwise, you might get pinned down. And once again, you might think you're big and strong, but that smaller, lighter opponent <laughs> might have greater maneuverability. And, and what happens in the natural, obviously, can always happen in the spiritual. Amen? The principles are still the same. You might think you know how to wrestle, but you might find out you really can't. Once you come against a true foe that knows 
how to wrestle. So the first thing we're going to look at is from the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at Psalms chapter 144. And we're going to read verses 1 through 2. Psalms 144, verses 1 through 2. A Psalm of David. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. So we see here a powerful um, passage of scripture. We see that it was written by David himself. Quite frankly, it was sung by him. The Psalms were songs. Um, but he says here, blessed be the Lord my strength. See, he's not trusting in his own strength. You know, he's, he's trust, trust, trusting in the strength of the Lord. And that's not just a physical strength, but, you know, strength is just not tied into what your physical attributes could do. You can have an emotional strength. You can have, like, a strength of determination. You know, quite frankly, a lot of the strength that um, we operate in a daily basis, the, the, the last aspect of it is what we do in the physical. It takes this emotional strength first to enable you to engage. So when he's saying, blessed be the Lord my strength, I'm sure he's thanking God that, hey, I can kill 10,000s, <laughs> as, as we've heard has been sung about him. But even more so, I believe he's saying, I thank you, God, for the strength you give me, my, the strength to lead, the strength of character, even though I fail from time to time, the strength to get up and continue to fight. You know, you look at the battle of, of Ziklag, you know, lost so much and, you know, wept himself soaring. God gave him the strength to, like, go up and get your stuff back. So he's thanking God that he is the true strength behind his life, not his own personal attributes. And then we go on, he says, you know, he not only is he my strength, but he teaches my hands to war. Mm -hmm. Yes, I learned how to use a sword. I learned how to use slingshot with rocks. I'm sure he learned different hand-to-hand -hand techniques and knife techniques. Those are the sort of things that you did, you know, as a warrior, you know, and having to go out in the battlefield. So he says that, and that's the thing, he says, like, I may have had earthly instructors that say, hey, here's how you use a sword. Um, you know, through trial and error, I learned how to use a slingshot effectively. Um, but I'm sure he's saying that not only did you give me strength, but, and I may have had earthly teachers, but behind the scenes, it's really you who has taught me the art of warfare, amen, and how to fight. So I trusted you. Yes, I had earthly teachers, but I trust in the insight you can give me, the divine revelation that enable, enables me to be an even, even greater warrior. And let's face it, I mean, come on. The human body, <laughs> you fight a few people, you're going to tire out. I mean, if you've ever been in any type of gym, boxing, martial arts, or whatever, um, when, when I did Taekwondo, um, a lot of times um, Bobby Leach used to make us do drills after drills after drills. And we have, like, um, we start off with, like, you know, 100 kicks, one angle, and then we go to other things. Then we do movement and, and different kinds of drills and, and then when we have sparring night and every time we knew it was sparring night, most of us just want to come in and spar. But no, he'd make us do probably about 40, 45 minutes of high energy calisthenic th stuff. Then he would allow us to spar and you saw the difference between those who were in the best condition and those who weren't. They knew the techniques to spar, but some of the people after a minute and he would make us spar for three minutes, at the first minute it's just kind of I can't quite get that kick up in the air. I know how to kick my opponent. I know how to punch my opponent, but I don't have the endurance. So David, as he's learning how to how to fight in warfare, he's not only learning the the physical aspects, but he's learning the mental, the emotional, the endurance, all the different things. Uh, he's learning on how to fight beyond just the manual tasks that are associated with warfare. So he says they. God is his strength, and he's the one that taught him how to fight. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, you know, you fight one person, that's enough. You fight five or ten people, that's enough. David was a, was a, was a terminator. 
you know, in, a, in battle, you fight, you kill tens of thousands of people. I mean, that guy was like, <laughs> he was a Terminator. He's probably like one, <laughs> two, three, <laughs> four, five. <laughs> I mean, to kill that many people over the course of his military life, it's just, it had to be divine um, power attaching itself to um, the role, the, the role, the purpose of God that, that that he had for him, Amen. To be able to war at that level, and he is basically saying, "I know you're the one that taught me how to fight and gave me an anointing to survive battle." And then he goes further, and this might sound strange, but why would he say he teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight? That sounds so strange because at first you're like, "Well, <laughs> my fingers are killing." But no, he's, he's really talking about precision in fighting. Amen? Because see, I can learn how to fight with a sword. I'm swinging a sword. Or I have a battle axe. But when you're talking about teaching my fingers to fight, that's where David is saying that, yes, you can fight with a sword. You can fight hand to hand. But then there's a form of fighting where you'll take something like a bow and arrow. And you have to know, when I'm shooting at an enemy, how far do I pull back the strength? And I don't know if you've ever shot a bow and arrow. We used to do that as kids. But you not only had to pull it back, depending on the wind and where you were aiming, how high you want to shoot it, shoot it, how far you want to go, and you know where the target was positioned. It might be a lower target or a higher target. You had to pull it back to a certain level. And let's say that the target was uh, 20 yards away. If you only pull it back a few inches, you might hit a bullseye, but you didn't pull it hard enough. I mean, far back enough, the arrow wouldn't penetrate the target because it would lose velocity by the time it hit it and it would bounce off. So I would have to know, like, okay, for that range target, I need to pull the string. And now it's like, oh, I got to pull it back further. And then another aspect was, was when you were literally about to fire the arrow, if you didn't release it smoothly, you could actually make the arrow go off course because the string hits your finger a little bit as you're releasing. And now the arrow, instead of flying straight, it shifts off at a, at a different angle and totally misses the target. So David is saying that you not only fought my, taught my hands how to war, but you taught me the precision of how to draw back my weapons of warfare, how to release them smoothly so that I could fire accurately and with precision. And so that's what God is telling us to do a lot of times too. Amen. I'm not only telling you how to fight with your overall body, and to fight with your arms or your hands. But he's saying, also, I want to teach you how to fight with precision. I don't want you to just be misfiring and hitting any old thing. You aim at the enemy over there, and instead you, you hit, <laughs> uh, you hit um, the people that use friendly fire. <laughs> and you got some casualties because you aimed at the enemy over to the right, you misfired, and you hit the innocent people over there on the left. Amen. I want to teach you to fight with precision so you know, amen, the depths of how far you need to go. You know the, the angle and the precise um, way in which you need to engage the enemy in battle so that you can hit the target every time. And as I use the illustration of the arrow, you might hit the ta target, but did you pull the string back far enough so that it penetrates when it hits? So it impels itself into the target instead of glancing off or bouncing, and you got an arrow sitting there in front of the target, which would be extremely embarrassing. Amen? And, of course, inefficient. So God teaches us the precision that you will hit the target and the things that you're doing. Amen? The things you're saying, the things you're preaching, the wisdom you're giving, the things that you're praying, that these things will hit with precision, and they would have a destructive purpose as it relates to the enemy, but a healing, productive, salvation-producing impact um, for the godly things that you're doing. So, um, and that's a whole other level of training. Quite frankly, you could pick up a sword and just start swinging it, and you might get lucky and hurt, wound, or kill the enemy. It's quite another thing to pick up a bow and arrow and know how to fire that thing accurately. You know, and as once again, paralleling the things from uh, the physical to the spiritual. You know, you can pick up a passage of scripture, but 
Do you know how to wield it effectively and precisely to touch the heart of that person or to reprove, you know, somebody that's going astray or to, you know, vanquish the attacks of the enemy? Once again, anybody can pick up something and just start swinging. Oh, I hit the enemy. Well, you got lucky. No, did you train yourself to use the weapon effectively? And can you use, you know, the broadsword, the bigger sword? Can you take that? And take it down to using something that's a smaller thing, but maybe more precise and more intricate and more effective. God wants us to get to that level of training. And the thing is, um, learning how to fight properly being trained requires repeated training, sensitivity to know how to fight, how to adjust. You know, um, and it also takes a certain amount of endurance. You know, you're never going to get to the point of being highly trained unless you've overcome hundreds if not thousands of failures. Amen? I'm kind of getting into stuff for the future. <laughs> but um, you're not going to get to a high level of training unless you've overcome failure. Okay. Name one art, one discipline that you become a scholar, a master, a teacher, a counselor, you know, a leader, unless you've already walk the path of failure. It's impossible. And, and in the cases where people were elevated without going through that process, nine out of ten times, people looking at it like, how they get that position? They don't know what they're doing. They don't deserve that role. And, you know, sometimes people are just being mean-spirited and they're jealous. But then there's time where you say, no, nah, that person shouldn't be that role. They're not equipped. They didn't go through the training process. So God wants us to go through the training process. And here's the thing. Sometimes with repeated training, you're going to have repeated failure. But the ones who become sharp and disciplined and motivated and can overcome, you know, failures are the ones who get to the place where they now have the, the confidence to continue to wage warfare against the enemy and succeed. You know, you only really become a champion after you've lost. Amen. All right, so the next one we're going to look at, and let me see. We're going to do a couple more before we uh, stop for today. Uh, next one is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. For as much then as Christ suffered in the flesh, <coughs> excuse me, arm ye yourselves also with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that ye no longer should live the rest of your life in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past may suffice to have wrought the desire of the Gentiles and to have walked in lasciviousness, lusts, wine-bibbings, revelings, carousings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them into the same excess of riot speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. So all we see here that Christ is suffering in the flesh, but he had a certain mindset in terms of how he would continue to conduct himself and engage with various situations. Despite the things he suffered, he still always had the mindset. He was kingdom-minded, and he was going to fulfill uh, the role that God had for him. And we see here that in the same manner, we are called to arm ourselves with the same kind of mindset. So when we're looking at that, arming ourselves with the same mindset as Christ, it's basically saying that we should have a readiness to suffer for the cause of our faith, even to the point of death, as Jesus Christ had. Once again, having a readiness to suffer for the cause of our faith, even to the point of death, as Jesus Christ had, had done. And notice that it says that, you know, previously you walked according to the lust of men. Um, and, you know, now that you're walking according to the will of God, it says that there's people that have known you from the past, and now they're speaking evil of you because you no longer take part of their lifestyle. You know, you're going away from lasciviousness and lust and wine bibbings and all these and the partying and all these things that they did. And now 
you know, they're critical of you. They're speaking evil of you. And he's telling us, we're being told here, don't think it's strange that they're talking trash about you because you're not running with them anymore. <laughs> That's just the way that it's going to be. But he says, hey, they're going to have to give an account to him because uh, he's ready to, when he's at the point of judging the quick and the dead. So they might be critical, but judgment's going to fall upon them. Not even because of how they treat you and talk evil of you, but just because we must all give an account. So he's basically telling us, don't worry about those things. They're going to speak evil of you, but continue to live according to the principles of the Word of God on a daily basis. And like I said, he tells us to arm ourselves with the same mindset. And one of the things that really um, crossed my mind as I was meditating upon this is that the arming that he's talking about us doing, arming ourselves with the same mindset that Christ had. This, arm, this arming is a mental arming that is implemented prior to putting on the whole armor of God or grabbing the weapons of our warfare. Because you can grab implements of war, you can put on armor, but if you don't have the right mindset, it's likely that you, you might be wounded, gravely wounded, or even killed in a battle unless you're able to retreat. You know, once again, just because you grab a weapon and put on armor doesn't mean you're going to be valiant on the battlefield. I hate to say it, but we had a situation where um, somebody was criticized when they had one of the um, the shootings at the school, um, and I remember the, the party in question, but person had the official right to come into the school as an officer of the law, had the weapon, but stayed outside. It was criticized because he didn't go in. So just because you have the badge, the uniform, the, the firearms and all that stuff doesn't mean that in the moment of crisis and warfare that you're going to follow you know, the training that you're supposed to follow. You know, it's a mindset, and you have to arm yourself with that prior to putting on your outer armor and picking up your weapons of your warfare. It's a mindset. So um, that's what he's basically telling us here. Arm ourselves with the same mindset that Jesus Christ had, and then once you've done that and your mind is in the right place, then you can put on your armor, pick up the implements of your warfare, and enter out in the battlefield. And here's the thing. You know, there's times where people do lose their weapons. You know, you swing your sword, you know, you get disarmed. Or maybe a sword hits a sword, your sword breaks. But you might still be able to fight and win because the mentality that you arm yourself with says, okay, I got a setback here, but I've armed myself mentally, so even though I don't have that physical weapon or that particular weapon at my disposal, I'm still determined to win, so I'm going to continue to engage in battle, and I'm still believing I'm going to have vic victory, and I will not retreat. It's a mentality, amen? And that's what he wants us to have, arming ourselves with our minds prior to picking up any spiritual weapons or putting on the armor, because the mindset, it, it, the spiritual mindset and faith in God is the thing that at the end of the day is going to enable you to overcome Everything the enemy is, is throwing our ways. Amen? It's not in the implements of our warfare. It's in the mindset and the trust and the faith that God's going to enable me to overcome. And if the enemy is able to, you know, dismember, you know, cut off my arm and take away all my weapons, my faith in God, my mindset, he's going to see me through and I'm going to have victory. That's the thing that's going to take you over to that hill more than anything else. It's a mentality. Amen? I don't care what you throw at me, devil. I don't know how. I don't care how many skirmishes you win. I'm still going to beat you because I know my God's not going to fail me. See, that's a spiritual mentality that you have to have that goes beyond anything else. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the weapons of a warfare and the armor are great. I'm not trying to, you know, take away from them, but the mentality. I trust Him beyond all things. I know I'm going to win. I'm totally confident. I will not lose. I shall live and I shall not die. That spiritual arming, that mental arming, that is the thing that we need before we pick up anything else. Praise the Lord. And that's the thing that we can't allow to go away. All right, last passage for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, 
but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So we're seeing here that God wants us to all run a race with the mindset that we're going to receive the prize. The great thing about the race we're running is that each one of us can be the champion. Each one of us can come in first place and win because there's an immeasurable, incalculable number of trophies and crowns that Jesus Christ has for us. So it's a strange thing in an earthly race, there's only one winner most of the time. Once in a while you get like a dual championship where they both get the, the, the title, but for the most part you get one champion and everybody else is a, a lesser level. Um, unless you're dealing with um, maybe like an elementary school thing where everybody gets a trophy. But unfortunately, in most races, there's only one champion, one winner, one belt holder. So he tells us to have a mindset here that we need to run as somebody who's trying to win the trophy or the championship. I want to come in first. And that's why it says, so run that you may obtain. Now notice there it says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That phrase, temperate in all things, and actually, it's getting back to what I was saying earlier, um, so I am sharing that today. <laughs> Most people who master something have only done so based upon having the determination to overcome repeated failures. Once again, those who have mastered something, it could be a sport, it could be art, it could be some type of other discipline, technology, you know, whatever, a degree, whatever it is. Cooking. <laughs> um, those who master something have only done so based upon having the determination to overcome repeated failures and to overcome the related discouragement that it engenders. You're going to have discouragement. You know, I want to be a cook. You know, you, you take a cooking class. You make a couple dish, dishes, invite the friends over. What do you think? And they all quiet. <laughs> Something tells me that you may not have failed, but uh, let's say, just say you haven't graduated to be a chef yet. <laughs> so you keep going. And you see, here's the thing. One person, they ain't like my food. See, I, could, I knew I could never be a good cook. I quit. I'm not doing it anymore. The person that has a champion's mentality, like, all right, all right, you didn't like it, but what was wrong with it? Oh, the season is wrong. The season was too much. You, know, you didn't cook it thoroughly enough. Uh, it was too cold. I mean, they might come back to you and say, hey, here's our evaluation. So you're like, oh, I don't appreciate it, but all right, I'm going to just have to suck it up. I'm going to go back to class. And you keep training and training, trying recipes. And after a while, people are like, oh, that was really good this time. You know, and you get to a certain level of, of, of quality and perfection. And, you know, you keep pursuing it till you become, you know, somebody that can be considered like chef quality meals. But once again, it's after usually a number of failures. Just saw an interview recently, um, former President George Bush, you know, the, the junior, not senior. And he's become quite the artist. Does oil paintings. Um, he just did a, re released a book recently where um, he wanted to really, um, bring out, like, here's the value of immigrants coming to our country. So he did a book of oil paintings of all these different people that he had come across. And one was um, Dirk Nowitzki, who played for the Dallas Mavericks for years. So they interviewed him. He did a painting of Dirk Nowitzki. And he, he described each person associated with the poem, I mean, with the portrait that he painted in his book. And they asked him, he said, well, were you always a painter? He said, no, I didn't take this up until after I was done politics. And they're like, but you're, you're really, really good. And he said, oh, I wasn't always that good. <laughs> he said, the first few classes, it was pretty ugly. Next few classes, it got a little better. And he said, I kept, I kept deciding, like, I want to do this. And he kept doing it to now he's published 
multiple works, and I've seen his stuff over the years. He's pretty good. But it, it came through repeated failure, but a determination that I want to master this craft. Quite frankly, one of the greatest differences between a master and a student is that the master has continued to rise up from the ashes of the feet to pursue what eventually became command and great insight over their discipline. You know, I actually um, talked to um, Sifu Maza before, and he had fought professionally around the world, no holds barred fights like the movie Bloodsport, where people could have been killed, and he won every fight. But he said people don't, they, pe people think about that, they don't think about all the years earlier that when people were be literally beating me black and blue for hours at different schools where I was training. He said, they didn't see that part. He said, I got... You knew what beat out of me repeatedly. Black eyes, bruises, got cut one time, and had to have surgery. He's like, I, he said, I basically went through. He said, they see the championship. They don't see the days where I'm like, I feel like I'm dying. So you don't become a master unless you had the determination to overcome great defeats and say, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep coming after you. I'm going to keep coming after that prize. Amen. And that's what God wants us to realize in terms of, you know, our wrestling against um, principalities. He wants us to get to the place where we realize that, you no, know, you might not win the first few battles. And I think sometimes when we lose something, we say, well, maybe I didn't hear God right, or, or, or God doesn't love me, or, or why didn't God do this? And we try to question God. And sometimes God's like, you know, part of your training, I'm going to let you get a little, I don't, they ain't going to kill you. But you might take a couple bruises. Ooh, that hurt. What are you going to do, student? Are you going to quit? Or are you going to get back up and say, you might have to just beat me more because I'm going to keep coming at you until I become a champion at this. Amen? You know, that's part of our training right now. He told me sometimes, you know, you're going to leave out of here sore. I'm going to punch you in your chest. I'm going to hit you upside your head. I said, bring it because I want to be good at that. So if that's the cost, that's what I'm going to do to master. And that's the problem. A lot of people say they want to be masters, but they don't have a master mentality. At the first sign of defeat, bruising, disillusionment, I'm checking out. And that's why, once again, we have so few masters. You notice there's, <laughs> there's always tons of students, tons of, of, of novices, amateurs, but how many masters do you truly have? The numbers are limited because most people don't have the zeal, the determination to continue to press past the pain of failure. And there's going to be times, once again, that we're wrestling, whether it's against human foes or spiritual influences behind the scenes. There's going to be times where you're wrestling against those things and you're losing or you're feeling like, man, I'm getting bruised here. But do you want to become a master in the art of the kingdom of God's warfare? Amen. God will give us all the capability to reach that point. But are we willing to engage and run the race so that we can win in spiritual warfare? Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to stop with that today. We'll continue on next week. We're going to start looking at, um, we look at the fact that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Next week we're going to start out, we wrestle against supernatural enemies and influences. And we're going to specify some of the things that we come against. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything you're doing in our lives. And right now, we praise you, Father, for the principles that we've been um, learning and focusing on. We thank you for uh, just everything that you're enlighten me in so that I can share it to your people. I praise you, Father, for all the principles, Lord, and even as um, you laid upon my heart, a lot of things that occur in the natural, the physical, the temporal are just illustrating what's going on behind the scenes in the supernatural realm. So we do praise you, Father, that we would have a mindset um, uh, just arming ourselves up and, Lord, we praise you that you give us the armor of light and the full armor of God and the weapons of our warfare. But we do praise you, Father, that we would see that we have to arm ourselves first with the mentality that 
no matter what goes on in my life, I'm going to continue to persevere, and I'm going to seek to become a master in all the things that you want to teach me. And even though there might be setbacks here and there, there might be times that there's total defeats, I just praise you, Father, that you continue to train and refine the things that I learn, show me the things that I need to learn, and there might be times that I'm sloppy in terms of how I wrestle, but I praise you, Father, that once again, you cannot become a master until you've suffered some defeat. So we praise you, Father, for that. We thank you, Father, for continuing to hone and refine everything that we're doing. We praise you, Father, that uh, we just we continue to have that uh, determination to continue to learn from you. And, Father, even as we do um, have victories here and there, Father, we praise you that there's always still another level of training and another level of proficiency that we can reach. So we just thank you, Father, for this. We continue to praise you, Father, that if any of us are currently dealing with spiritual warfare, that you would show us how to view uh, the attacks of the enemy, and you would show us how to respond. I even thank you, Father, for showing us how to not only have our hands to war, but once again, to have the precision of our fingers to fight so that we would shoot accurately the weapons of our warfare at the enemy and we would strike the targets. And we just give you the praise, honor, and glory for this. Also praise you, Father, for um, the week ahead, yes, that you right. continue to keep us healthy and strong, especially as they're starting to change the guidelines regarding the coronavirus to open things up more. We thank you, Father, for giving us wisdom, discernment. Show us the places that we can go to, to safely. And if there's places that we need to, to avoid, just give us a check in our spirit. We praise you, Father, for insulating us against sickness and disease and continue to allow us to be a blessing in the lives of those that we interact with. And we thank you also for divine safety in our coming and going on the roads, Father, that um, just keep reckless drivers away from us. And we just thank you, Father, in advance for a blessed week in which we're blessed, as well as being blessed, uh, blessing unto your kingdom. And we thank and praise you, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.